George Floyd. There, I've said his name, <clears throat> and there are many others whose fate has brought us to this point. Is this a turning point in our history? <clears throat> that will be for later generations to judge. We who are in the middle of these unfolding events, we're the ones who by our actions will write that history. We all have a part to play. You, the members of ECOG Akron who have joined this call, your participation shows your openness to recognizing and rethinking racism. By coming together, we can have influence within our scientific group and beyond. ECOG Akron has a history of over 30 years being committed to promoting equity, diversity, and engagement to foster inclusiveness in cancer-related issues. Dr. Mitchell has done amazing work in bringing together groups who have helped us to make progress. Now it is the role of all of us to take this work forward together. In the past, we have promoted equity in our activities. It is time now to actively oppose racism to take a specifically anti-racist position. The journey to accomplish this in our group begins today. The, the program uh, today is designed to raise our consciousness relative to how systemic racism and its associated impact on socioeconomic factors impact cancer care and outcomes and to begin a conversation about what we can do as a group to make progress. Our focus is broad, including what studies we do, how we design our studies, how we influence our members to think about caring for diverse cancer patients, and how we create opportunity for all roles within the group. I'd like now to introduce Melissa Simon, who chairs our Health Equity Committee, uh, to begin our program. Melissa? Thank you. Thank you, Peter and Mitch, um, for your leadership of ECOG Akron and your uh, resolve to, to march us, help us march towards that North Star to end racism, to end interpersonal, structural, and institutional racism. And we can do it. And um, I want to thank you all. Um, there are a lot of participants, almost 300 right now on this Friday afternoon, who are going to march with us. And so this is our first of many um, conversations and hard, hard, courageous conversations that we're going to have to move towards uh, making uh, racism dissolve completely, to blow it up. Um, and I want to thank our esteemed panelists that we have today. Um, first and foremost, our co-chair, my co-chair of the Health Equity Committee, our fearless leader, Edith Mitch, Dr. Edith Mitchell, who is a clinical professor of medicine and medical oncology at Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center at Thomas Jefferson University. She's also the Associate Director for Diversity Programs and Director of the Center to Eliminate Cancer Disparities for the Cancer Center at Jefferson. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction, uh, Dr. Simon. And thanks to Dr. O'Dwyer uh, and to Dr. Snall for being uh, proponents of this effort to move forward. ECOG Akron has been a major proponent of National Cancer Institute-based cancer research since its inception during the 1950s under the leadership of Dr. Gordon Zubrod. Through other leaders, during the years, especially Dr. Robert Comas. Dr. Comas was an ardent leader in expanding ECOG Akron research opportunities to investigate cancer for all populations. And it was through his leadership that I started with the Equity Committee and have worked with it since that. Now we have with Dr. O'Dwyer and Dr. Snall the effort to move forward. And certainly we've all been influenced by uh, the national 
uh, encounters in the last few weeks that have brought our attention to racism in a number of ways, especially with COVID-19. And we see that individuals, either with cancer or from minority backgrounds, have a higher mortality rate from COVID-19. So we all thought this was an opportunity for us to listen, to think, to have input ourselves, to look at where we are now, where we've been, but more importantly, where are we going and what are we doing about not only the disparities and outcomes in cancer, but for all of us to look at our own footprint to see what is it we can do as a group, ECOG Akron, uh, as an individual, and in our respective communities, what can each of us do and what can all of the ECOG Akron participants do to make sure that not only are we looking at uh, equity in outcomes from cancer, but also developing strategies that eliminate the racism part of medicine, of healthcare, and thus of cancer research and cancer care. So what are we talking about in terms of our goals? A number of us have gotten together over the last two weeks to develop some goals that we think are important. And these goals are under three categories. First, to address structural racism in ECOG Akron footprint so that it is a thing that we do. Uh, we want to increase student and resident uh, and fellow participants as well as graduate medical school, uh, medical uh, participants in our research so that we're increasing the number of underrepresented minorities in our work. Uh, we want strategies to mitigate racism in clinical trials design and execution. So we've got to think about that in all of our processes as we uh, develop uh, various strategies for cancer care and cancer research. We want to work at anti-racism to achieve a promotion in cancer health equity so, this is, so that it's a major focus for us at ECOG Akron. And we want to increase disparities research in our efforts, in our plans, in our strategies so that we are constantly evaluating processes that are going to lead to better outcomes. For number two, we want to actively promote equity and fairness. We want to speak out against racism, promote diversity by inclusiveness, and forming allies so that we've got everybody involved and all of our efforts engaged in the same direction. We want to demand justice in the provision of cancer care so that we are giving the best for our patients at the right time. And number three, ECOG Akron adopts a specifically anti-racist stance going forward. No longer can we say, I'm not racist, we've got to show that we are anti-racist and working against uh, structural racism and systematic racism in our groups. So if we are addressing cancer disparities, what are these cancer care disparities? Why do cancer care disparities even matter? What is the current status of cancer disparities? What can ECOG Akron do about cancer disparities? And what can each of us individually do to make change? So it's all about change now. Next slide, please. Historically, we have collected information and these next two slides are taken from the American Cancer Society for which I appreciate. And if you notice, from the right side of this, uh, from your left side of the screen, that African-American, non-Hispanic, 
individuals, non-Hispanic blacks, have the highest incidence rates and the highest mortality rates than any other group in the United States for which we collect data. And this has been present for many years. We've got to address that. Next slide, please. For non-Hispanic white females, uh, although the incidence rates may be lower, the overall mortality rates note that they are higher for African-American women or non-Hispanic black women. And again, we need to address this issue in our clinical trials, and not only in the establishment of the clinical trials, but in the implementation, so that we are including individuals into our clinical trials. Uh, it is well recognized that over the years, ECOG Akron uh, has included approximately 9% of black patients, non-Hispanic black patients in our clinical trials. But that's not enough. We need to reach back and bring other individuals into our clinical trials so that the percentages of individuals on our clinical trials approximate the incidence rate in the uh, society uh, so that we are addressing that. And for example, for African Americans, approximately 13% of individuals in the United States, according to the last census. Therefore, we need to continue to improve on that percentage rate in our clinical trials. But not only that, the important facets of establishing the clinical trials so that we are partnering with patients, we are partnering with communities so that they therefore want to be a part of our clinical trials, want to be involved, and therefore extend the information regarding participation in clinical trials, participating in ECOG Akron, in their organizations, in their communities, so that we've got more individuals interested. And each of us will have to do that in our local communities, as well as participation in ECOG Akron. So next slide, please. Uh, note that cancer incidence rates have been higher in blacks compared to whites and among both male and female over many years. And if you note from 1975 all the way through 2014, uh, there that African Americans in red have the highest incidence rates uh, in cancer in the United States. Next slide, please. Cancer mortality rates, again, very important for us to know that mortality rates are higher among black population compared to whites whether it's men or women. Next slide, please. Dr. Harold Freeman provided us information on some of the causes of health disparities. And what we have from his work showing that while the environment of the genes uh, have influence and there are, we all recognize the uh, genomic input into development of various cancers, but the gene environment can be influenced significantly from poverty, low economic status, social injustice, and culture. And for all of these, we need to look at these uh, impact factors in our communities to see how we can be the proponents for patients to remove these influences on the gene environment in the uh, development of cancer. And if we're going to be successful for patients, 
we've got to address all of the uh, issues related to uh, cancer from prevention through early detection, diagnosis and incidence, making sure patients have the right treatment at the right time, and then the influences on post-treatment quality of life and survival and mortality. So it is so important that we look at all aspects of the patient environment and influence at every area so that we can say we are addressing the issues related to cancer. Um, I mentioned the workforce before and the fact that we need to increase the number of trainees in our work. Uh, from medical students, and even before that, but at least now we need to work with the uh, influences in our students, in our residents and fellows, and our graduate students, so we can influence graduate students and our trainees to address the issues related to increasing the number of underrepresented minorities in our ranks. Note the two lines, um, areas across many years, both in red and green. And note that for uh, black doctors, black doctors represent approximately 4% of all the, of the physicians in the United States. And it has been stable uh, at that number over years. So we're not increasing the number of black doctors. The sa same is true for Latino um, physicians in this country, low rate, about 5%. And there has been a gradual and small increase over the years. So consequently, we need to increase the number of underrepresented minority physicians in this country. And if you were to um, look at just the oncology uh, areas, uh, that is even smaller than the overall numbers in uh, or percentages in the country. So we've got to do what we need to do in order to increase the number of black doctors, of Latino doctors, uh, and it is well recognized from the literature that uh, Latino physicians are more likely to return to um, neighborhoods where uh, they are recognized and speak. Uh, the same thing is true for black doctors. They are more likely to return to um, communities where they are going to speak and take care of patients. And also that is true of Native Americans. So we must increase the number of physicians taking care of patients. And we actually received this information from the um, Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education. And ACGME provided me the next two slides uh, suggesting that we all need to work to increase diversity, to enhance equity, and to make sure that we have inclusion. And therefore, as a part of this for diversity, we've got to look at the workforce and make sure that our workforce uh, percentages of underrepresented minorities approximate our communities and therefore show that we have a diverse workforce. We also must show uh, that there is equity in outcomes and inclusion so that our culture makes people feel comfortable, make sure that they join with us in the efforts and therefore actively participate in our cancer clinical trials uh, efforts so that we are working for our individual uh, communities for our patients. So for ACGME, uh, the recommendations are to uh, acknowledge the issue and make sure we're speaking about it. Uh, make sure we accept 
what is known about the issue, that we build those strategies that include tools, skill building, so that we're all comfortable, we're all knowledgeable, and we all know the direction that we're headed. And we must assume accountability, uh, accountable for the uh, uh, numbers that we have now, accountable for our outcomes that we have now, making sure that we are aiming for higher ground. Uh, and of course, for my military, uh, uh, aiming for the air, uh, but making sure that we all acknowledge and accept responsibility that equity is important and equity matters. Uh, and again, from ACGME, uh, ACGME for Graduate Medical Education has uh, developed what is called a strategic plan. So with the first part, which is innovation, we've got to acknowledge the fact that what we have done historically needs reamplification, needs reimagination and innovation so that we are moving forward. So ideate on barriers and challenges form and using existing learning communities to problem solve and devise solutions so that we are including this in our strategies as we move forward. Use and expand our learning community. So we're incorporating all of our individuals and participants into our work and into our plans for implementation. Uh, and then we need to assess our solutions as we move forward. So as we move forward with the plans that Dr. Schnall and Dr. O'Dwyer identified, ECOG Akron ahead of the group as we move forward in eliminating racism as a barrier in cancer clinical trials. And what we've developed at the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center is incorporating all of these proponents as we look at the populations in our catchment area and working to increase um, participation in cl and clinical trials participation for those patients, we've got to incorporate a lot of factors. Those include community outreach and education so that we're saying the right things to the right patients at the right time and we are using verbiage and education uh, to collaborate with the groups and with communities so that the uh, communities are all working with us. We must look past the patients and look at partnerships and strategies in our communities so that we can overcome those barriers that uh, contribute to a lack of participation in our clinical trials and we therefore must incorporate the entire community. Uh, for our researchers, we must include the basic scientists, the clinical scientists, and we must all communicate so that we're getting the right information into um, the clinical trials development and research processes. Uh, we must also make sure that we are collecting data and making sure that our behavioral and epidemiologic scientists are included so that we are uh, collecting the right information for participation. And putting all of this together, we can therefore move on to increasing clinical trials and participation of populations so that we are doing better. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Um, next up is uh, Dr. Otis Brawley, um, Chair of the ECOG Akron Social Determinants of Health Working Group, Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Oncology and Epidemiology at Johns Hopkins. He leads a broad interdisciplinary research effort of cancer disparities working to close racial, economic, and social disparities in the prevention, detection, and treatment of cancer in the U.S. and worldwide. He is a former professor of oncology and hematology and deputy director for cancer control at the Winship, Winship Cancer Institute at Emory and the former chief medical officer and scientific officer for the American Cancer Society. Without further ado, Dr. Brawley, thank you for joining us. 
Thank you very much, and it's a privilege to be here. And I want to thank Dr. Uh, O'Dwyer and Dr. Schnall for putting together this. And I want to thank you, Dr. Simons, for putting everything together. I want to talk for the next 10 to 12 minutes a little bit, defining the problem of health disparities and making sure that we are very inclusive. I'm incredibly motivated by the Martin Luther King quote from 1966, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And I really want to talk a little bit about what are the disparities and make sure that we are inclusive of everyone and not exclusive of any group of people. This is a, a well-known slide that shows that there's been a 29% decline in uh, risk of death from cancer from 1991 to 2017, the last year for which we have data. I want to note that we're in a public health crisis, the disparity in chronic diseases, the fact that lives are lost and could not, is really the fact that lives are lost that could be saved. And it's been looked at as a black, white, or racial problem. But one of the points I want to make in this talk is it is more than a black, white problem. Indeed, there are many people who need help, and we need to reach out to all of them. And I think how can we provide care to include preventative services is some of the most important things that we can think about. These are using the OMB racial ethnic categories. And this is just to show you from 1991, Blacks in blue, whites in orange, uh, the decline in mortality for blacks has been greater than for any other group. Native Americans have been basically static over the last 30 years, and Asians and Pacific Islanders are a lower mortality than uh, Native Americans. This is showing it for a couple of uh, the major diseases, colorectal cancer, prostate, and breast. I want to note for blacks and whites, the disparities in colorectal and breast cancer only came about in 1980 or so after we learned how to screen and treat for the diseases. That's when the disparities in mortality actually began. And much of the problem for black-white disparity is people not getting standard therapy. Um, now, I'm a big proponent of clinical trials and a big critic of the NIH law that says we have to do valid subset analysis. I believe we should include people of all uh, colors, all backgrounds, all regions of the United States in clinical trials because we have a number of studies that show that patients on clinical trials receive higher overall quality. We also, and this is important to this audience at ECOG, we have data to show that doctors who put 2% of their patients on clinical trials take better care of the other 98% compared to physicians who do not participate in clinical trials at all. The big problem with disparities in this country is people not getting adequate care. And we have data to show that doctors who participate in clinical trials provide better care to all of their patients, not just the small percentage they put on clinical trials. Now, why the decline that I showed you a little bit ago? Good prevention, especially tobacco control. Wise early detection, and when I say wise early detection, there is some unwise screening out there, and then improvements in cancer treatment. When we talk about prevention, the decline in smoking is something that's amazing and incredibly important. 55% of American men smoked cigarettes in 1955. 35% of American women smoked cigarettes in 1966. And we've had dramatic declines uh, over the last uh, 50 to 60 years. Tobacco is still a leading cause of cancer death. These are the percentages today or in 2017, the last year for which the CDC has given us data. And note, uh, for Native Americans, I should note, very high smoking rates in the plains in North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, very low smoking rates, almost no smoking amongst Native Americans in Arizona and New Mexico. No smoking amongst men or women. This is not a typographical error. 
educated people less likely to smoke more so than educ uh, than less educated people. Lung cancer mortality by state, high amounts of mortality in these states in the middle of the country. And please note, you're going to see this pattern a lot in my talk. Uh, energy balance, that is not just obesity, but obesity, consuming too many calories and lack of exercise. Right now, it's the second leading cause of cancer in the United States, and it is going to grow as a cause of cancer, and with the decline in tobacco use, will become the leading cause of cancer in the next five to 10 years or so. Obesity as the leading cause of cancer. This is an American problem, and I'm going to show you it's also a racial problem as well. 15% of Americans were obese in 1970, over 35% today, and you can see it truly is an American problem compared to other countries. Uh, this is obesity amongst black women over time compared to obesity in black men or white men or women. This is where it becomes a true racial problem. Let's look at breast cancer very quickly. Uh, there's been a uh, there's been a 40% decline in breast cancer death rate since 1990 or so. Uh, this shows you the declines in various states. Again, the purple states started where the blue states started, but the blue states have had a 44 to 51% decline in mortality. The uh, uh, purple states have had a 20 to 29% decline in mortality. Tremendous differences there. Um, I want to point out that uh, Mary Jo Lund noted that 7.5% of black women in Atlanta diagnosed with a localized curable breast cancer did not receive surgical removal of the tumor within the first year of diagnosis in 2000. A substantial number of women of all races get less than optimal breast cancer care. There are estimates that almost 40% of all American women, not black women, all American women with breast cancer have something wrong with the treatment of their disease. Provision of adequate care is a logistical issue. It is not new science. CISNET modeling, by the way, uh, actually shows us that somewhere between 9 and 11 percent of all breast cancer deaths are due to the failure to follow accepted screening guidelines, but 20 to 27 percent of all breast cancer deaths are due to the failure to receive appropriate care. This is not for black women. This is for women in general. And looking at colon cancer, again, a 50% decline in colon cancer deaths since 1980 in the United States. These are the states that have not had a 50% decline, and these are the states that have had a 55 to 63% decline. We all started at about the same place, but we're starting to develop disparities that are Massachusetts versus Mississippi versus black versus white. Indeed, the causes of disparities are differences in prevalence and quality of screening, proportion treated, and the quality of treatment, and their differences by race, socioeconomic status, as well as region of residence. Again, I come back, how can we provide adequate high quality care preventative services and treatment to those who don't receive it. These are humans who do not receive adequate care. Uh, this is the Affordable Care Act Medicaid expansion by state. And again, you'll note the states in the southern United States are the states that have not adopted uh, Medicaid expansion. We're going to have increasingly disparities by state, not by race. Indeed, one is better off right now being a black woman in Massachusetts versus a white woman in Oklahoma when it comes to breast cancer mortality. Uh, and so I'm going to end with the true cost of American health care in defining the disparities. As I was leaving the American Cancer Society, we actually calculated how large is the disparate population? How large is the population where cancer deaths are preventable and where do they live? 
Who are these people? And we were able to ter- determine 132,000 of the 600,000 deaths that are going to occur this year would be preventable if all Americans got the care that all Americans should get. It includes preventative care. So in order to fix this problem for people dying this year, we needed to go back 30, 40 years. But 132,000 Americans, that's more lives saved by giving people adequate care than any breakthrough drug or treatment or breakthrough screening that we have ever had in cancer. Just give people adequate care. By the way, the majority of that 132,000, about 80,000, are white Americans. So as we talk about disparities, we need to talk about giving all people adequate care. And as we go back into our clinics, we need to think about how we can give people adequate care, how we can also try to make sure that our uh, colleagues are giving adequate care. So the issue of disparities in health is not just a racial issue, it really is an issue of socioeconomics. Uh, Cancer control should focus on disease prevention with these things, as well as getting very good basic care to include appropriate screening and treatment to all humans. Again, I come back, how can we provide adequate, high quality care is the most important question. Now, we have seen improvements in screening and treatment in breast cancer, and it led to disparities in black-white mortality. As we have improvements in precision medicine and immunotherapy, we're going to have disparities in socioeconomic, by socioeconomic, rich, poor. We have to look out for that. That's the only way we can prevent it. I'm a big advocate for preventative medicine because in prevention, we do not have these socioeconomic or racial disparities. Again, we shouldn't strive for equality. We should strive for equity. Equity realizes that some populations need a little bit more than other populations in order to get where we're going. And the purpose of my talk is to stress, it's not just we need to focus on blacks, we need to focus on all human beings who need that excess. I end with a picture of uh, the Johns Hopkins Medical Institutions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Raleigh. That was amazing. And uh, one more step in that little fence picture. We want to get rid of the darn fence. (laughs) So that's where we're going. Racial justice, as somebody noted in the question and answer. So I'm just going to give a shout out one more time. There is a question and answer that we're taking, and I'm monitoring it. So please put your questions up. Without further ado, um, Dr. Carmen Guerra is next. Uh, She is the Ruth and Raymond Perlman Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. She's the Vice Chair of Diversity and Inclusion in the Department of Medicine. She's the Associate Director of Diversity and Outreach at the Abramson Cancer Center, Advisory Dean um, to the Dickens House at the Perlman School of Medicine. And her research focuses on eliminating access to cancer screening prevention and clinical treatment trials. Dr. Guerra. Thank you so much, Dr. Simon, for that kind introduction, and thank you to Dr. O'Dwyer and Schnall, as well as Mitchell, for the invitation, um, and to the ECOG Akron staff, um, and to all of you for sharing your valuable time with us on a late Friday afternoon. I really applaud all the members of ECOG Akron for uh, reevaluating their role uh, given the major societal changes we are facing, and, um, and applaud Uh, the positioning of the organization towards one that has an anti-racism stance. So if I could have my slides come on up, we will start. And um, as they are coming up, I am, you know, also, I'm always grateful to listen to Otis because he does such a wonderful job summarizing the uh, tremendous disparities that exist in cancer care. And one of the reasons um, we chose to uh, speak today about unconscious bias is because this is one of the reasons that people think uh, there are so many disparities. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time um, looking at unconscious bias today and what we know about unconscious bias and um, what, what, uh, how it impacts uh, our, our behavior. 
and uh, then we'll transition to um, anti-racism. So let's see if I can get my slides here to move. Could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So that's our agenda today. As I just described, we'll move on to the next slide. So um, many of you may have heard the term. Many of you may have even sat through courses about unconscious bias or workshops. Um, and essentially, this is uh, defined as the learned stereotypes that are automatic. In other words, our brains don't really um, uh, respond in a, a very t comprehensive way when we are um, in front of a situation. It just uh, holds automatically um, a uh, thought or a behavior uh, that we've had that actually fills in the story for what's in front of us, whether that's a person um, or a circumstance. And um, they're often described, biases is often described as the stories we make up about people before we learn who they are. And uh, as many of you have heard, everyone has uh, bias. And I tell people that if you're human, you have biases too. And if you are uh, unconvinced, you can take a test to determine what your biases are. Uh, it's called the Implicit Association Test. And um, it's at the Harvard website. And after uh, 10 million tests, what we can draw as conclusions is that 75% um, of the U.S. population has a pro-white and anti-black bias. 50% of the population uh, that identifies themselves as black also have a pro-white uh, and anti-black bias. And we also know that 76% of the population also has a pro-male bias. Um, and so uh, if we can go to the next slide. My computer's not responding. These biases are important because uh, there's a lot of evidence that shows that uh, biases impact not only what we see, but also how we act. And many of these biases have names. Um, you can see here on the left, affinity bias is a bias where we choose to be among people who are like us. Anchor bias is the bias where uh, the first bit of information that we get about somebody goes on to affect the way we view them, such as, uh, for example, a Harvard graduate, and that then sh uh, shadows all the other things that we think about that person. Uh, halo and horn effects are um, when we first meet somebody, if, if we are impressed by something that they do, we often are uh, give them a halo effect and we think that they're also capable of other good things as opposed to a negative first impression. And then we condemn those individuals um, to uh, having uh, more negative impact in our lives. Uh, confirmation bias is a bias where um, you initially have a hypothesis and then whatever information that you learn thereafter you use uh, to confirm your initial hypothesis or impression, and so on and so forth. And all of these biases then lead to uh, our perceptions, our attitudes, our behavior, uh, as well as who we pay attention to and can result in microaffirmations or microaggressions, which are subtle um, behavioral cues and signals uh, that, that, that can be um, either discriminatory uh, to individuals. Uh, an example would be um, if somebody uh, has uh, sees a black person across the street, a black man, and they clutch their purse. So that's a, an example of a microaggression. Next slide, please. Uh, if still unconvinced uh, whether you have biases or not, I'll ask you to take a look at this picture and, and describe what you see. And generally, most people will take a look at this picture and describe a CT scan. And uh, this is a CT scan that was shown to uh, a lot of radiologists who are used to evaluating these for nodes. And, um, and it turns out that the majority of people do uh, miss completely the uh, gorilla that's actually in the right corner of the lungs of the CT scan um, in, in this spot here. So if you go to the next slide, this is um, a study that was done called the Invisible Gorilla Strikes Again, and it really shows um, how our attention bias can sometimes uh, lead to us not seeing some uh, potentially obvious important data in front of us. Um, and this study where they uh, evaluated the gorilla that was 40 to 48 times larger than the average node, as you can see, 83% of the radiologists missed it, even though eye tracking data showed they actually looked at the gorilla. Next slide, please. 
Um, so why does unconscious bias occur? Well, it turns out that there are too many stimuli that um, are coming at us every minute of the day, over 11,000 of them, and our brains are not capable of um, actually receiving and analyzing all those stimuli. In fact, our brains are only capable of processing about 40 of those. And uh, Daniel Kahneman uh, won the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, back in 2002 for his book and his theories that talk about how two thirds of our brain are actually based on this fast brain or system one thinking that drives our um, both our thoughts and our behavior. And this is based on instinctive and it's very visceral uh, and, and emotional. Whereas one third of our brain is the slow or system two uh, brain thinking, and that's much more slow slower and deliberate, thoughtful and logical, and it mostly occurs in the prefrontal neocortex. Next slide. And the impact of this bias is quite major, um, and it affects us all uh, as, as individuals that care for patients that design clinical trials. The overwhelming scientific literature shows that unconscious bias uh, impacts patient care. Uh, there are many studies out there. I won't have time to review many of these with you, but there are a few that, that um, uh, actually came out of our, our, our division at Penn where they showed photos and videos of both male and female, black and white individuals. Uh, Dr. Sankey Williams went on to show that the same case history uh, led to physicians ordering different workups of chest pain. Um, this uh, unconscious bias also has been shown to lead to inappropriate management of pain. There's a huge literature on pain that black individuals uh, will receive less pain medication. And um, it also uh, has shown that there are, uh, because of unconscious bias, our patients who are black receive less opportunities to participate in clinical trials. My own research has shown this where we will sometimes um, ask our uh, providers to uh, tell us why a certain individual got by race was not offered a clinical trial. And what we hear often is that black individuals um, the decision was withheld to offer a clinical trial because there was a physician who felt that the clinical trial might cause undue burden, that the patient might not have enough caregivers or transportation. And that was a decision that physician made without offering the trial. So these are due to their own biases. So these are real, they exist, and they really impact patient care. But in addition, unconscious bias, as we have come to learn, also uh, affects our, our ability to create a diverse workforce. Um, it's been shown that unconscious bias determines who we select and how we evaluate our colleagues, our coworkers, and ultimately our leaders. And this drains an organization. It leads to limitation in their creativity, its innovation, its cultural competence. Um, and it also affects patient perceptions of that organization as either being relevant or irrelevant in their lives. And so overall, um, uh, unconscious bias can lead to um, overall limitations in the reach and the potential of an organization. Um, so understanding uh, these unconscious biases is definitely a good first step uh, for mitigating uh, them. However, next slide, there are other um, uh, strategies to also mitigate these unconscious biases, and they include self-awareness and being able to recognize uh, that one does have biases, that these are real, these exist, and being aware of your own blind spots and triggers, maybe by taking the IAT. Um, it's also advised that bias like this occurs more commonly when people are stressed and when they're tired or they're trying to work quickly. So slowing down is really important to reducing bias. Uh, furthermore, it's important to use transparency and an inquiry method. In other words, checking your assumptions, be, if you have assumptions about a particular person or situation, just out, talking about those out loud and sharing your perspective and obtaining more data um, to help you make better decisions and better assumptions. And finally, um, there's a method called MRI, Most Respectful Interpretation. This was from a course that uh, Nancy Rothbard teaches at the Wharton School here at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, where she talks about how you may interpret an action or someone's words in a certain way, but it's possible that those were the intent of those was different and that you may wish to think about the potential other intents and always assume a most respectful interpretation. Next slide. 
In addition, uh, AAMC and Howard Ross have proposed this um, method called PAUSE uh, between the stimulus and reaction to mitigate bias by paying attention to what might be at play beneath any kind of assessment before you make an assessment, acknowledging your own reactions, interpretations, and judgments, and then understanding uh, other possible reactions uh, or interpretations or judgments, uh, just like MRI also poses, and then searching for a most constructive and empowering way uh, to deal with the encounter, and then executing a plan based on that. Next slide, please. And, and, and while unconscious bias is important to acknowledge that can occur um, by us, it's also important to acknowledge that we might be bystanders when biases are occurring to other individuals. And for this reason, I did include these resources, which are um, a uh, resource from the Southern Poverty Law Center called Speak Up. Their aim is to take bystanders and make them into up standards, as they say, using these six steps. And I have found that having a campaign um, throughout your institutions and your offices helps people understand how they can speak up when they see bias, because they need to feel they have the freedom, and they also need to be empowered to learn how to speak up for others when they confront bias uh, that's being acted against somebody else. WMC has an, an ERASE framework, uh, and they'll be conducting workshops um, as well on these uh, that, that target faculty who may be witnessing uh, bias from patients, uh, either against themselves, their staff, or their students and trainees. And so this is another resource that's available, again, uh, freely available on the web at the AAMC site. At the end of um, this talk, I'll also include my email, and I can send anybody who wishes any of these resources uh, directly to them. Next slide, please. And finally, another uh, AAMC model, this one targets uh, diversity and recruitment of diverse individuals into the workforce is this EAM model, experiences, attributes, and metrics. We typically and historically have used metrics to evaluate people for jobs and experiences and opportunities. And what they claim um, is that this model actually allows you to do a more holistic uh, evaluation of candidates without sacrificing quality as defined by the metrics that we traditionally have been using. Next slide. So even though I have talked about unconscious bias, and even though organizations can hire individuals who are not racist and focus on diversity and inclusion efforts and implement the unconscious bias trainings that we were talking about, and even publish anti-racist statements, Organizations can still be racist organizations. Next slide. And that's because um, you, it's so necessary to make the systematic changes that um, will affect the structures, the policies, the values, the practices, and the norms of, of those organizations. Um, so this is the critical part. This is the structural part, and this is where most organizations need to spend their time um, as we uh, aim to become anti-racist organizations. It's going to require a lot of introspection. It's going to require stakeholder input, um, especially uh, from the stakeholders that traditionally have not been represented, uh, members of oppressed groups, to help them understand how all of these uh, changes can help them become a more inclusive, diverse, and anti-racist organization. Next slide. And this is a process. This is this chart here I've put, and we're not going to go through it all. I just want to illustrate the point that this is going to be a process. Um, as you can see from the top, this is a continuum to being an anti-racist, multicultural organization that starts out from one that is exclusive and segregated and subsequently goes through uh, a series of processes that take it to one that's um, not only inclusive, but then shares power um, and designs a new system of a transformed organization um, that subsequently is able to serve the needs um, of, of everyone, of all, especially those that have been historically oppressed. Um, and once that transformation happens, it becomes um, exponential. That group not only shares a shared sense of community among each other that's, that's really ju rejuvenating, but subsequently feels that they have the ability to address 
other uh, wider uh, systemic injustices, whether that's regionally or nationally or, or even globally. So this is um, an important slide because it illustrates that this is going to be a long journey. Um, and I'm happy to share again any of these. And with that, I think this is my last slide. I just want to say uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, I would be happy to, now to send it back to Dr. Melissa Simon, who's, who's going to address a few questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Guerra. Um, thank you all for joining us. I know we're mindful of time right now. Um, I want to, we've had some good questions that I want to go uh, really quickly over. First, please join us. We're going to continue this conversation. We've just touched not even the surface, right? Our North Star is to head towards racial justice and and racism, right, and structural and institutional racism, and really racial justice is, is the North Star. And this is a marathon. This is not going to happen overnight by no means, and we're going to make mistakes, but we're all in this together, and you join us. So our Health Equity Committee meetings meet every, um, usually it's the first Friday unless there's a holiday. So like this July 3rd is a holiday. So it'll be the following Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Um, there's an email, Brenda Affleck, um, who is our wonderful supporter of our committee. And so please note that that's what we're gonna do. Um, uh, we're gonna continue these conversations both in that committee, but also um, have uh, group-wide um, webinars like the one we had today. I mean, again, we unconscious bias is just one part. There's a overt bias and then all the other um, racism issues that I've already uh, stated. Other things, um, inclusion. So uh, groups that are not traditionally included in trials, we're going to be talking about as we move forward as well, like pregnant persons and transgender persons, et cetera. Um, including community is super important, and we do do that, but we can do more and we can do it better. Um, the slides we're going to try to share, or at least the video recording of this lecture, of this uh, talk um, on the website. Um, and also, uh, I think that really is, that sums it up to, to not take up too much more time. Um, I want to thank you again. I want to thank our, our leaders, Dr. O'Dreyer and, and Dr. Schnall for, you know, helping us journey and all of our speakers, Drs. Brawley, Mitchell, and Guerra, thank you very much for joining us uh, on this afternoon. And I think with that, we can close our meeting. Only two minutes over. Oh, and yes, my picture. I had one slide and it was kind of like what I was trying to say with Dr. Brawley's slide with the fence, we want to get rid of the darn fence. Why is there a fence to begin with? So if we all really orient ourselves towards this picture, and that's also on the internet, the fence picture is also on the internet, but if we really want everyone to get an apple or something, achieve a goal, we got to acknowledge that not everybody is going to have the same access or ability to get that apple or goal and that we have to acknowledge that we have to uh, modify the list that we give for every person, acknowledging our commonality of we are all humans. So if we can respect that and acknowledge that, then we can, in the equity world, uh, allow for a higher ladder, if I may, to help somebody reach the tree to get the apple. But in the real racial justice, and social justice world, it goes even further. We have to make that tree make sure it's not bent in one direction, right? And make sure the fence is gone. And so that is where we're going. That's what justice is. So with that, I, I want to close. Thank you.